There are times in life when you want to give up everything and do the worst, but this is not always the way out. I am incredibly grateful to my sister, who supported me during a difficult period of my life, because I was ready to commit a terrible act after I found out about my wife's infidelity. But everything turned out to be completely different from what it really was, and I was in shock. On Friday night, I found myself at the back of the club, nestled in a shadowy corner, observing the painful unraveling of my 22-year marriage as my wife indulged in intimacy with her colleague, Terence Long. The signs had been there for weeks, dwindling intimacy, pointless arguments, late nights at work, and her newfound social outings with the pretext of just having a couple of drinks with her female co-workers only to return well past midnight. Despite my efforts scrutinizing her belongings and her phone, I found no concrete evidence until tonight. So as she purportedly enjoyed a casual drink with her colleagues, I staked out her office building, vigilantly watching for her return. It was then, in his car, that they passed right before my eyes, confirming my suspicions. Watching them behave like a pair of adolescents, his hand discreetly beneath the table, and I was certain of her involvement. She reclined with an expression of ecstasy on her face. I had captured the entire scene on my phone and was preparing to depart both the club and my marriage. Just as he rose and invited her to dance, the gaze she bestowed upon him mirrored the one she once reserved for me in the early days of our marriage. In that instant, I understood that forgiveness or reconciliation was futile. She belonged entirely to him. Whether they had consummated their relationship yet was inconsequential. She was lost to me. It was then that I realized she had extinguished the last flicker of love I harbored for her. As they twirled on the dance floor, oblivious to the world around them, I approached their table, dropped my wedding ring into her glass, and departed. I drove home, aware that a storm was brewing, but resolved not to weather it. Anticipating this outcome, I had already made arrangements and packed my bags. Upon arriving home, our temporary rental until we found a permanent residence, I loaded my belongings, including my tools, into the back of my old pickup truck. With my laptop in the passenger seat and my phone switched off, I was determined not to entertain a litany of lies and excuses. After our two children left for college, we moved out of our big house, which she insisted on. For the remaining funds, about $300,000. We were planning to go on a tour of Europe, fulfilling our long-held dreams of traveling. I checked into a motel for the first night, where I sorted out our finances and split them evenly after settling and canceling our credit cards. I transferred most of the funds, except for $10, to another account reserved for her birthdays and Christmas presents. I emptied my office safe, which held $10,000, and my pistol, and stored the items in the glove compartment. I emailed it to my boss along with an explanation. I informed him that my company car was parked at my address, with the keys hung on a hook in the garage. I expressed regret and assured him that I would provide details for my final paycheck. As the chief engineer responsible for building turbines for both the Navy and civilian markets, I was confident that my assistant could manage in my absence without any issues. After showering and getting ready for bed, my sister Sarah called curious about what was happening. I simply advised her to speak with Linda and ended the call. It was the most peaceful night's sleep I'd had in weeks, as the doubts and suspicions were finally put to rest, allowing me to move forward. I had a lot of fun dancing with Terry, don't even think about calling him Terrence, looking forward to our first night together in his room. While we had moments for quick dates during lunch breaks and supposed bachelorette parties, Spending the whole night together was very different. I tried to push away thoughts of the conversation I was going to have with Jake tomorrow. Terry assured me that Jake would come to his senses as soon as he realized that if he didn't, I would leave him and he would have to pay me spousal alimony while living in a shoebox. I would have everything, my devoted husband, whom I adored, and a young attractive lover who would fulfill my desires. But I couldn't help but wonder if it would be as exciting as when it all opened up half the fun of sneaking out on Jake. Still, I was looking forward to returning to our room, anticipating a night full of passion. Terry had already given me a little pleasure with his careful movements under the table, but that wasn't enough for me. After dancing a few more tunes, we returned to our table. 
Terry quickly drained his glass and motioned for me to do the same. As I was raising my glass, I noticed something inside. Taking it by the finger, I took it out and saw that it was an engagement ring. A sudden chill ran down my spine. I reached out and turned on the table lamp that Terry had turned off earlier to get some privacy and create a romantic atmosphere. I looked at the inscription on the inside of the ring. To my dear Jake from his loving bride, Linda. I was on the verge of choking. There I sat, staring at the ring, and a rush of memories from our wedding and honeymoon flooded my mind. Panic seized me as I realized the implications of what I had done. Jake must have caught us together and understood that I was having an affair. In that moment, all plans for the evening evaporated as rationality returned. I loved Jake deeply. How could I have ever considered betraying him in such a way? What was wrong with me? Had I been influenced by some alien force? Frantically, I glanced around, fearing Jake might still be present. I felt an urgent need to throw myself at his feet and beg for forgiveness. But of course, he was long gone. Terry took the ring from my trembling hand and examined the inscription. This changes nothing. Now that the little cuckold knows about us, you are going to confess to him tomorrow anyway. He'll just have to accept that I'm the alpha male and he's the beta. I began to look at Terry in a different way, realizing that he had never disrespected Jacob before. It downed it on me that his intentions weren't just to be with me. He took pleasure in destroying Jakey and our marriage. I was furious with both him and myself for being so easily deceived and seduced. You despicable jerk. Jake is superior to you in every way. I do not know what I see in you. Did you give me illegal substances or something? Yes, I gave you illegal substances the first time, but after that you couldn't resist. You're just insanely beautiful. He was giggling as he spoke, but his laughter was cut short when a man put his hand on Terry's shoulder and intervened in the conversation. Okay, buddy, you just confessed to a serious crime in front of numerous witnesses. By giving her illegal substances and using it for selfish purposes, you committed a terrible crime. Sit down and wait for the deputy sheriff. I'm Sheriff Mason, and you're under arrest. He then forcibly seated Terry, who looked very frightened, pulling out a notebook and pen. I also noticed he had a sidearm on his belt. He began questioning witnesses. Several people stepped forward, claiming they heard what happened. When the sheriff asked if I would testify, I agreed, provided my name and address, and asked if I could leave. I suggest you humble yourself before your husband and plead for forgiveness. That's precisely my plan. I just hope it's not too late. I hurried out of the club, attempting to call Jake, but my number was blocked. Damn. I hailed a taxi and requested the driver to hurry, offering to pay double the usual fare. Arriving home, darkness enveloped the surroundings. The garage door stood open, revealing Jake's company car, but not his pickup truck. Panic set in. I was too late. He had already left. Desperate, I called Sarah, Jake's sister, whom I regarded as my own. Hey, Linda, why the late call? Is everything okay with Jake? Unable to speak, tears streamed down my face. Finally, I managed to utter, I don't know, I'd messed up, and now Jake's gone. I can't reach him, and I'm lost. Don't worry, it can't be as bad as it seems. I'm coming over. Just brew some coffee with extra sugar and hang in there. I wrapped up the conversation with Linda and dialed Jake. He picked up after the second ring, his voice sounding worn. Jake, where are you? Linda's frantic, searching for you. What's going on? It's better if you ask her. I plan to, but she's in a panic and you're not picking up her calls. Why? Like I said, ask her. Now I need some sleep. And with that, he ended the call. I got dressed and drove over to their place just a 20-minute ride away. Upon arrival, I immediately noticed Linda's car was gone, along with Jake's truck, while his work vehicle was parked in the garage. The door was unlocked, so I let myself in, announcing my presence. Inside, I found Linda on the floor, crying. I helped her up and settled her into a recliner. After making some coffee, she had calmed down. All right, Linda, let's hear it. I called Jake, but he refused to say anything and told me to ask you. 
he sounded really low. What's happened? After coaxing the story out of her, I found myself torn between comforting her as she seemed genuinely ashamed of her actions or lashing out in anger for hurting my brother. Ultimately, I chose neither course of action and simply sat there, observing her turmoil. While I could forgive the first instance, considering she was drugged, her subsequent return for more was inexcusable, and Jake wouldn't forgive her either. The person who initiated this mess by seducing Linda was facing legal consequences and a long prison sentence, which I didn't envy him. However, the question remained, what should be done about Linda? Could they move past this betrayal? Reflecting on my own experience with Tracy's infidelity, I knew I couldn't forgive easily. I dissolved our partnership and sent her packing. I suspected Jake might do the same. Then there were the kids to consider. Wendy would likely distance herself from her mother, being closer to her father, but Mike was loyal to his mother. If he took her side, it would crush Jake. It was a messy situation. I decided to mediate and try to reconcile them without alienating Jake. I helped Linda to her bedroom. She could barely walk, undressed her, and put her to bed. I knew I needed to talk to Jake, but it would have to wait until morning. I woke up feeling better than I had for weeks. It's amazing how taking decisive action can uplift your spirits. Unwilling to continue living in a motel, I phoned Sarah to inquire if I could temporarily stay with her. Hey Sarah, where are you? I'm at your place. Linda's still asleep. I figured since it's Saturday, I'd let her rest in. Where are you? I'm at the motel on 401. I was wondering if I could crash at yours for a bit until I figure things out. Of course, but remember, you have a home here. Not anymore. Did she tell you what happened? Yeah, and I'm furious with her for it. But there's more to the story than you know. The guy she was with admitted to drugging her, and the sheriff arrested him after overhearing their argument and gathering witnesses. Doesn't matter. I saw the way she looked at him and knew it was over. She looked at him the same way she used to look at me during our honeymoon. I can't speak for what you saw or thought you saw, but she's genuinely devastated. Can't you at least hear her out? It might prove to you to get closer and help you move on. It's still too fresh. The pain is unbearable. I just want it to stop. How could she betray us like that? Was I such a terrible husband that she had to find someone else? Wasn't I enough for her? I can't take it anymore. I just want it to end. Can you understand that? Of course, I went through the same ordeal when I found out that Tracy cheated on me. I wanted to destroy them both, drown my sorrows in alcohol, and even considered leaving this world. Now that I think about it, it seems like a tempting option. Do you remember that show about the smash band in Korea? Do you remember the title song? Does that mean anything to you? Right now, it sounds like a relief to me, an end to suffering. Jake, don't even joke about this. It's not a laughing matter. Oh, but it is, and it seems to be the right way out. Sarah was about to speak when I turned off the phone. My thoughts went back to the gun hidden in the glove compartment downstairs. Yes, that would be enough. Linda will carry the burden of guilt for the rest of her life. I packed up my things, checked out of the hotel, loaded them into the back seat of my truck, and drove away. At first, I wasn't sure where I was going but I remembered the quarry and headed there, parking on arrival. I took the gun out of the glove compartment and made sure it was loaded. Sitting there, I examined the firearm, trying to weigh the pros and cons of my decision. Behind, instant relief from all my problems. No more suffering. No need to confront a lying wife and no impending divorce proceedings. Against. The adulterer would have gotten everything. Why should she benefit from betrayal? My sister would have been shattered. Our parents had left naturally long ago. And then I thought about the children. Even though they had already become adults, they still relied on casual guidance and did not deserve to be left without parents. I stashed the gun away and dialed my sister's number. Thank goodness. I was worried you might have done something reckless. When I checked the gun safe and saw your pistol missing, I feared the worst. Where are you now? I called the motel, and they informed me you've already checked out. I'm parked at the old quarry just thinking. I entertained the idea of taking the easy way out, 
but then I weighed the pros and cons in my mind. It was a close decision until I thought about Down and Mike. I couldn't put them through that. It wouldn't be right. So tell me, what should I do? You've been through this before, so please, tell me what to do. Listen, Jake, there's no easy answer. You need time. Come over to my place, have a meal, get some rest. I'll be home as soon as I can. Linda needs someone with her right now. I know it may seem like I'm picking sides, but I'm not. You both mean the world to me, but if it comes down to it, I'm on your side. Now go on and give me a call once you're there. With nothing else to do, that's exactly what I did. I set the phone aside, my body still trembling from narrowly avoiding losing my brother. Glancing at my hands, I noticed they were still shaking uncontrollably. My emotions were in turmoil and tears began to flow unexpectedly, serving as a cathartic release. Soon my tears escalated into sobs, but I found solace as arms enveloped me, offering some measure of comfort. I awoke and scanned the room, as if hoping it had all been a nightmare. Jake's side of the bed remained untouched, and I ran my fingers over his pillow, catching a faint whiff of his scent. Clinging to his memory, I berated myself for my foolish actions, wondering if Jake would ever forgive me. These thoughts consumed me as I shook them off, threw on my robe, and pondered who had undressed me and put me to bed. The events of last night flooded back as I reached for the door, barely steadying myself. Curiosity lingered about Sarah's presence, whether she had stayed. Intent on making coffee, I descended the stairs, only to find Sarah on the couch, tears streaming down her face. Sitting beside her, I enveloped her in a comforting embrace, reminiscent of soothing a child. Amidst her sobs and attempts to speak, I simply held her until she calmed. I'm sorry for breaking down like that, but I've been on an emotional roller coaster all morning. It's me who should apologize. I've caused all of this. It's entirely my fault. I never imagined I'd betray Jake like this, but I did, and I can't understand why. You'll need to find a more hopeful explanation when you talk to Jake. He's on the brink, and it wouldn't take much to push him over. Have you spoken to Jake? How is he? Where is he? Is he coming home? And what do you mean by on the brink? I recounted my conversation with Jake, and when she realized she had almost caused his death, her expression first turned blank. Then she fainted. Being a nurse, I knew what to do. I gently placed her on the couch and elevated her feet with some cushions to improve blood flow to her heart. Afterward, I prepared some coffee and fetched a damp towel. I hoped the aroma of coffee would rouse her as I gently wiped her face with the towel. Eventually, she regained consciousness and sat up. But she still appeared vacant. Despite my attempts to engage her in conversation, she remained unresponsive. I tried pinching her neck firmly enough to cause discomfort, but there was no reaction. Slapping her yielded no response either. She was completely catatonic, realizing there was nothing more I could do. I dialed 911 and requested an ambulance. I had encountered similar situations with PTSD patients before. They would retreat into a mental space where they felt no pain. Sometimes they would snap out of it quickly while other times they would drift in and out unpredictably. Unfortunately, in some cases, this withdrawal from reality became permanent, with individuals regressing to a childlike state. I drove behind the ambulance to the hospital and admitted her. When the doctor inquired about the cause of her condition, I recounted the events of the past 24 hours and how Jake's actions had nearly caused harm. The doctor recommended that Jake also undergo assessment for PTSD before he endangered himself further. When asked for her insurance information, I explained that I would need to contact her employers and Jake for those details. Upon informing Jake about Linda's condition, his demeanor shifted immediately. I'm heading to the hospital. Glancing at my phone, I felt a glimmer of hope. Twenty minutes later, he arrived only to be barred entry by the doctor, who feared it might do more harm than good. He mentioned that more information would be available after the resident psychiatrist spoke with her. Soon after, an administrator arrived to complete her admission papers. When asked about insurance, Jake searched Linda's purse and found her company insurance card. Handing it over, the administrator left, promising to return later.
Jake explained that he had resigned and wasn't certain if their coverage was still valid. He promptly called his boss to withdraw his resignation. Relieved, his boss informed him that since it hadn't reached HR yet, nothing had changed. Linda had been administered a potent sedative and was completely unconscious, so they allowed us to stay by her side. I observed Jake holding her hand tenderly, which warmed my heart. I pondered what could have motivated Linda to engage in an affair. It was completely out of character for her, considering how much she loved Jake, just as I did. I expressed to Jake that I needed to return home to freshen up, grab a bite to eat, and change, assuring him that I would be back soon. Anticipating Linda's awakening on Sunday morning, we were instructed to wait outside until the psychiatrist arrived. Both of us were starving, so we headed to the canteen for breakfast. Upon our return, we found the psychiatrist already with Linda, so we waited for him to finish his session. Initially, he prompted us to recount the events leading up to the present, urging us to be thorough, regardless of the discomfort it might cause. We recounted everything, from the moment Jake had caught her with another man, to the present, including Jake's downward spiral. The psychiatrist mentioned he had attempted to communicate with Linda, but received no response. She had retreated into herself completely. He explained that her mind had suppressed recent events as a protective measure. Subsequently, she was transferred to a psychiatric facility under the same doctor's care. While I resumed my routine, visiting Linda every Sunday, she remained unresponsive. One Sunday, her doctor intercepted me before I reached her room. Mr. Walker, there have been developments in your wife's treatment. Yesterday, she inquired about her whereabouts and your location to the nurse. Upon learning this, I promptly visited her. It appears that she has regained much of her memory up until the beginning of the affair. Strangely, she shows no recollection of the affair itself. It seems she has completely blocked it from her memory. If, after a few months, she still doesn't recall the affair, it presents an opportunity to potentially salvage your marriage. The woman you're going to see now is the person she was before the affair. Am I correct in assuming that only you, me, your sister, and your boss are aware of the truth? Yes, that sums it up. What are you proposing? We could fabricate a narrative about a nervous breakdown induced by overwork and a hormonal imbalance. Linda did experience a hormonal imbalance which might have contributed to her behavior. I believe she was unwell when she engaged in the affair and may not have been entirely accountable for her actions. The medication she was given combined with her hormonal issues could have made her susceptible to temptation. It was your return of the wedding ring that seemed to snap her out of it. However, upon realizing the gravity of her actions and your near suicide, she was overwhelmed with guilt and shut down emotionally. If this guilt resurfaces, she could spiral further into despair. If what you're saying is accurate and Linda's actions were influenced by illness, I can't simply walk away without violating my vows. I promise to support her in sickness and in health, so I must fulfill my responsibilities. How do you suggest we proceed? I cannot dictate your actions, but I can offer a suggestion. If Linda's amnesia persists beyond the three-month mark I mentioned, and if you wish to remain together, it might be best to relocate, either out of the district or preferably out of state. Start afresh with new jobs or transfers if possible. Keep Linda occupied with work and avoid returning here. Remaining in this familiar environment may trigger her memory and lead to a complete breakdown. It's crucial to keep her away from old friends and especially her current job. While she may be summoned to testify against Terence Long, I can attest that she is medically unfit to do so, without risking her mental health. You, however, may be called to testify. If this occurs, keep it from Linda. I've provided you with plenty to consider, so now go and visit your wife. I entered my wife's room to find it empty. Upon inquiring with an orderly, I learned she had ventured into the garden. Stepping outside, I found Linda seated at a picnic table, her gaze fixed on the horizon. Taking the seat across from her, I reached for her hands and she responded with a smile. It pained me to see that familiar smile, one she hadn't directed at me in ages, the same one she had recently shown Terry. In that moment, I felt both love and resentment toward her. I had to remind myself that this was the Linda I once knew, not the one who had caused me heartache.
If our relationship was to mend, I needed to suppress my own pain and offer her compassion. Yet I couldn't help but wonder if I would ever fully forgive her, let alone rekindle our intimacy. Then she spoke, Jake, it's good to see you. What happened to me and why am I here? I thought the doctor had explained everything to you. He did, but it all seemed so confusing. He mentioned a breakdown at work due to stress and hormonal imbalance. Is that accurate? Yes, unfortunately. But the important thing is that you're improving. You'll need to remain here for a while longer for observation and medication adjustments. Now that you're back, I'll visit you every day. I promise. I raised her hands and planted a kiss on them. She let out a sigh and returned her gaze to the horizon. The past three months seemed to pass quickly, with Linda showing improvement each day. We could now engage in conversations about anything and everything. Despite her lingering concern about her memory loss, both the doctor and I reassured her not to strain herself trying to recollect, as it could trigger another nervous breakdown. At the doctor's request, I visited him. Mr. Walker, I believe your wife has come to terms with her memory loss and is prepared to rejoin you by your side. However, I understand you may still harbor doubts about forgiving her, but she is not the same person who caused you so much pain. So on those tough days when you feel the urge to lash out, remember that she won't comprehend why. In her mind, she hasn't committed any wrongdoing. Therefore, on such occasions, restrain yourself and remain silent. I'll be discharging her into your care, so please handle her delicately. She's quite fragile at the moment. Regarding intimacy, allow her to initiate, exercise patience, and above all, be gentle. Let her set the pace and lead the way. I suggest starting with cuddling until she feels comfortable with sexual intimacy. I haven't informed her about her discharge yet, and I won't until you're fully prepared. Just inform me when you're ready, and I'll handle the rest. As I drove home, I attempted to analyze my emotions regarding her return. I felt relieved that she had made significant progress, yet uncertain if I was emotionally prepared to cohabit with her, fully aware of her past actions. I harbored concerns about the possibility of a recurrence. Anticipating her return and the commencement of our new life together, I requested a transfer from my boss to our offices in the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, Maine. He mentioned a vacancy for the company's area representative to the Navy, which suited me perfectly given its similarity to my current role in customer relations. Given the importance of the position in direct dealings with the Navy, it also came with a substantial salary increase. Understanding our recent challenges, my boss also offered to find a mid-level position within my team for Linda. This arrangement would allow me to keep a close watch on her and alleviate any concerns about her straying again. The day arrived when I picked up Linda from the hospital. As I walked into the clinic, she was already waiting for me, and she immediately rushed into my embrace. Initially, I hesitated, uncertain of how to react, but then I embraced her back. My feelings about the situation were ambiguous, and I had to remind myself that Linda was unaware of any wrongdoing on her part. After bidding farewell to the doctor and staff, we headed to the car. Linda gazed at me affectionately and said, I can't wait to get home. I've missed you all so much. Linda, we're not going back home, I replied. I've been transferred to Maine to our office at the Naval Shipyards. It comes with better pay and housing. The doctor believes a clean break is necessary to prevent any recurrence of what led to your breakdown. Our belongings are in transit and will be placed in storage until we decide what to do with them. Meanwhile, we've been assigned merry quarters on the base. It'll only be temporary until our permanent residence is ready. You can choose all the decorations and color schemes. We're heading to the airport now to catch our flight to Maine, so just relax and enjoy the journey. Six months have passed, and I adored our new house and carefully furnished it to my liking. Each piece of furniture has found its ideal place. Jake seemed distant at first, but gradually we regained our former intimacy after my nervous breakdown. Now we worked as a team where Jake was the boss and I was his personal assistant. Although this dynamic might not suit everyone, we accepted it wholeheartedly. Strangely enough, Jake felt more at ease despite the increased workload. Since we moved here, our intimacy has become even closer and we made love at least three times a week and often more often on weekends.
My love for Jake is unshakable, and I would never intentionally hurt him. My memory returned, including the events related to Terence Long. All this came flooding back to me during my stay at the clinic. One evening, as I was sitting in the common room, an episode from the news flashed into my mind. The trial of Terence Long, my former boss. He was accused of borrowing from illegal substances and having a bad relationship with women, and he confessed to many crimes. Despite pleading guilty, his sentence was reduced to 15 years. That evening, I struggled to sleep, tormented by dreams in which I was a victim. By morning, my memory returned to me, revealing the disturbing truth about what had happened. Understanding why the doctor advised against remembering, especially considering how close I was to hurting Jake, almost pushed me to the edge of the abyss again. After careful consideration, I decided to keep this newfound memory to myself. I was afraid that if Jake found out that my memory had returned, he might leave me. Despite this, I knew that he still loved me and the thought of him suffering without me was unbearable. My devotion to Jake knows no bounds, and I vowed to become the embodiment of the perfect wife, fulfilling all his desires, even if they seemed unacceptable to me. But over time I got used to it, and I had no complaints about my husband. The only thing I regret is that I did not immediately tell my husband what was happening to me. It was a painful and the most expensive experience in my life. Thoughts of what happened occasionally haunt me making me uncomfortable. Moreover, I understand that I should tell my husband about everything I remembered, but I can't bring myself to do it. I have no attraction to other men, and I understand that I will remain faithful to my husband. My betrayal wasn't psychological. I was under the influence of a bad person who shamelessly took advantage of my naivety. But the only thing that bothers me is that my husband has changed his attitude towards me. I understand that he occasionally remembers my betrayal and takes it out on me. I tolerate a lot from him and understand that I can't refuse him. He seems to have an ace up his sleeve that he uses, and in my opinion, it's not good. It's been quite some time since then, and our family life seemed to have settled. My wife was affectionate and tender towards me, but over time I noticed a change in her behavior, as if she had remembered something. But I wasn't sure. She would often withdraw into herself, and when we went to bed, I felt a slight tension. I understood that she had something to tell me, and I made several attempts to understand what was going on, but Linda would evade my questions, usually saying that everything was fine. Eventually, I realized that the memory of those awful days had returned to her, and I understood that our marriage could be in serious jeopardy. I became more demanding of her, offering her things she would have refused before, and now she would comply with all my requests which began to infuriate me. I wanted her to initiate the conversation and share her problem. I was afraid she might betray me again, and then I wouldn't be able to forgive her. I realized that this was a big issue, and over time Linda became even more withdrawn. So I decided to send her to a psychologist and went with her. I don't know if therapy will help us, but I really hope that everything will be fine. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.